Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video, I'm going to react to the best, the greatest sandwiches of all time. Now, this is going to be a tough list because there are thousands of different types of sandwiches. For me personally, my favorite two all time are probably the BLT and maybe the uh, the ham and cheese with pickle. Oh my God. I mean, simple but delicious, but I'm sure there's like hundreds of ones that I've never tried that would look great. Like there's one from Maine. I think it's the lobster roll. Whenever I see like either a picture of it or video of it, I just, my mouth starts watering into it like, immediately. I really want to try that, but you can't really find that here unless you make it yourself, which I'd rather just get one like made for me, to be honest. But yeah, this video is, I'm sure it's going to make me super hungry and good thing I'm, I'm about to go food shopping after this. So maybe it might inspire me to, to get a nice sandwich, but yeah, this should be fun. Let's do it. The sandwich Ooh. is the perfect meal. It's portable, it's filling, and there are endless possibilities. That's Sandwiches true. can be sweet or savory and served hot or cold. Are you a vegetarian? Great, have a sandwich. Are you a meat lover? Great, here are more sandwiches. <laughs> Check out our favorites. She's not wrong. You shouldn't need a recipe for this. The it's in the BLT. name, folks. Bacon, lettuce, and tomato. The beauty of the perfect BLT is that if you use good B, L, and T, you will have a good BLT. <laughs> This sandwich is all about using good quality ingredients. That said, there is a little margin for error. Basically, the bacon needs to be freshly fried, hot and crispy. The lettuce must be anything other than iceberg and have some real bite, and the bread must be toasted. The origins of the BLT are a bit opaque. I'm not sure about that one. Like, I don't think the bread has to be toasted. I don't mind some soft bread on a BLT. Some believe it's a descendant of English tea time sandwiches from the Victorian era, oh. while others believe it's an American variation on the classic club sandwich, which was popularized in the dining cars of America's bustling railways. According to Michelle Jordan, author of the BLT cookbook, the first mention of the BLT can be found in a 1903 issue of Ladies Home Journal magazine. Who knew? Has a tuna melt ever been spectacular? I've never Probably tried a not, tuna melt. but it's a diner classic for a reason. Classically open faced, oh. but sometimes served between two slices of that bread, this good. sandwich combines toasted bread, tuna salad, and melted cheese. While the true origin of this sandwich is somewhat murky, the tuna melt was allegedly invented at a Woolworths lunch counter in 1965 in mm. Charleston, South Carolina. According to writer Warren Bobro, an order for a grilled cheese sandwich on white bread with a smear of mayo came in. Then, atop the griddle on a shelf, a freshly made tuna salad sits on the edge. And as if guided by a hidden hand, the contents tip over, falling on the grilled cheese. <laughs> Voila, the tuna melt is born. Is that really how it The happens? tuna melt can be a polarizing sandwich. Not everyone is a fan of warmed up tuna salad and cheese. What's the secret to a perfect tuna melt? Crispy, substantial bread, not too much tuna salad, and actually melt that cheese, please. Yeah, I think you definitely need toasted bread for the, co the, the contrast, you know, a bit of texture. There is nothing quite like the simple pleasure of eating a good grilled oh, cheese yeah. sandwich. Absolutely. What's the secret to making one? First, make sure that you choose a cheese that melts well. The question as to whether you should use butter or mayonnaise on your grilled cheese can be pretty polarizing, but whatever spread you decide to butter use, remember to, to go low and slow. 100%. The last thing you want is some unmelted cheese in between two slices of burnt bread. This is cold and the cheese isn't hardly melted down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I've got a snake in this kid. <laughs> <laughs> did such a simple, perfect culinary invention really? appear? Something similar to today's notion of a grilled cheese can be traced back to World War II when Navy cooks prepared American cheese filling sandwiches. Mm. The term grilled cheese didn't appear until the 1960s, though preceded by toasted cheese or melted cheese sandwiches. A banh mi is a Vietnamese sandwich on a short mm. French baguette. Banh mi. banh mi can refer to a type of short baguette, but when used outside of Vietnam, it's generally referring to a sandwich that is filled with a fusion of Vietnamese and French flavors. There is no one singular banh mi recipe, but generally they- It looks super healthy considering all of the green stuff, you know? They have pickled vegetables, vegetables, mayonnaise, cucumbers, cilantro, Maggie seasoning sauce, or another seasoning sauce such as a soy sauce and a meat filling. 
The banh mi came into Looks existence tasty. with the French colonization of Vietnam. The French colonizers grew crops and raised livestock in Vietnam to approximate their European diet, but they were unable to grow wheat in their new colony. Uh, the French shipped bread into Vietnam, but only the French could afford it. It wasn't until they left that the Vietnamese were- Isn't that crazy that once upon a time, bread was super expensive? You know, bread is probably one of the cheapest foods you can get now. Like, I can get a loaf of bread for like 50p. That's what, like 60 cents? Free to create their own invention, the banh mi we know and love today. Don't order a Reuben on a first date or a at a high-pressure business lunch. This is a sandwich that can get pretty messy. <laughs> Between two slices of rye wow, bread, there should a be a lot of pastrami, sauerkraut, pickles, Swiss cheese, and a tangy Russian dressing. You're probably going to need a toothpick or two to hold it together. <laughs> Why does this sandwich have a first name? Who is the original Reuben? One potential claim of the origin of the sandwich is that it was invented by the owner of a hotel in Omaha in the 1920s who named it for one of his regular poker players. Okay. But there's a competing story of the origin of the Reuben sandwich that seems a little less like a fairy tale and more like a believable fact about delis in New York. It was invented by Arnold Reuben at his sandwich shop on East 58th Street in 1914. That makes sense. Either way, it's delicious. Mm. 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 That is incredible, mm. Jan. <laughs> Here's another messy one. The French dip is a hot sandwich consisting of thinly sliced beef served on a baguette with a side of beef broth for dipping, hence wow. the name. It's usually served plain, but it is sometimes topped with Swiss cheese and onions. Man, it looks simple, but God, is it making me hungry. I am definitely gonna have to find a sandwich. Two famed eateries in Los Angeles claim to have invented the French dip, Coles and Philippe's. Coles feels like a sophisticated speakeasy, whereas Philippe's feels more like an old-school diner or cafeteria, with the floor covered in sawdust. As for who makes a better a French dip sandwich, place. that is, of course, a matter of opinion. But as to which hundred-plus-year-old eatery can claim to have the original French dip, it's hard to say. But if it were Philippe's, the, the original French dip may meat. have been a pork sandwich. Ooh. In a 1951 interview with the LA Times, Philippe Matthew recalled, one day, a customer saw some gravy in the bottom of a large pan of roast meat. He asked me if I would mind dipping one side of the French roll in that gravy. I did, and right away, five or six others wanted the same. And just like that... A cheesesteak is all about the, the gooey melted cheese and the thinly sliced steak. steak. And the Philly cheesesteak is associated with a place perhaps more than any other sandwich. To make a cheesesteak, you need a thinly sliced sirloin or ribeye. When it comes to the cheese, the classics are provolone, American cheese, and cheese whiz. You can stop there, or you could add some caramelized onions, mushrooms... Definitely some onions. Onions I love. They're just so flavorful, man. Hot peppers or bell peppers, then put all of that together on an Italian roll or, as they call it in Philly, a hoagie. The cheesesteak was invented in 1930 by Pat Oliveri, a hot dog vendor and namesake of the legendary establishment Pat's King of Steaks. He decided to add a little variety to his menu, threw some beef on his grill with some onions, added it to a bun, and an early version of the cheesesteak, a steak sandwich sans cheese, was born. The cheese came later, and it became a classic. The Monte Cristo is a fever dream of a sandwich, neither savory Ham nor sweet. Cheese, great it's a combo. sandwich, and it's also French toast. In short, it's a ham and cheese sandwich yeah. dipped in an egg batter, fried in a skillet, and then dusted in powdered sugar. You just can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong with ham and cheese. The first incarnation of the Monte Cristo is the Croque Monsieur, aka the original grilled cheese sandwich. Originally served at a Paris cafe in 1910, the Croque Monsieur is made up of a gruyere and ham pressed between two slices of bread and fried in butter. While there's no exact documentation, the Monte Cristo supposedly entered the scene in the 1960s in Southern California and exploded in popularity after the Blue like Bayou restaurant one. in Disneyland began serving it. Nice and thick. If you could put summer in New England Here on a bun, go. a lobster roll would be it. I'm glad the two that I mentioned at the start of the video, actually three, the BLT, the ham and cheese, aka the Monte Cristo, and now the lobster roll have all been mentioned. The best lobster rolls are simple Main, and, right? apologies Serving to anyone Main. who doesn't live in New England or the Canadian Maritimes, yeah. fresh. 
Lobster is a delicacy, so just a touch of Ooh. lemon and mayonnaise are all you really oh. need to add to the lobster wow, meat to really make it sing. Lobster that. rolls are traditionally served in a split-top hot dog bun with chips or fries on the side. My goodness. The first lobster roll was served at Perry's, a Milford, Connecticut restaurant in 1929, and really came into its own in Maine, the heart of the lobster fishing industry in the 1970s. The early Maine lobster roll was very simple. Warm lobster served with butter on a hot dog bun. How much does a lobster roll cost in New England or Maine or anywhere in the US? A real nice thickly packed one. Like what, what are we talking, 10 bucks, 15? Just don't forget that one cardinal rule, fresh. Did you just order lobster in a diner? <laughs> yeah, why? Because it's a diner. Even if you love Mexican food, you might not be familiar with the torta, also torta. known as the Mexican sandwich. Like the banh mi, the torta is a culinary remnant of French colonialism. But unlike the crisp baguettes the French brought to Vietnam, the torta is served on a soft roll. Like the perfect corn tortilla, the bun of a torta is a soft, subtle springboard for the assertive flavors inside. There is no one torta recipe, but there are a few popular varieties, such as one with carnitas served on a sourdough roll that's spread with refried beans. Carnitas, is that beef? I think it's beef, isn't it? The whole torta is then covered in a spicy sauce and topped with raw onions. The most simple, shelf-stable, kid-friendly sandwich, jelly. and perhaps the first Classic. sandwich you ever ate. A triumph of American ingenuity and processed foods, the first step in making the PB&J possible was the invention of peanut butter in the 1880s. Contrary to popular belief, Dr. George Washington Carver did not invent peanut butter, oh. although he did advance the peanut as a crop in the American South. In 1895, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, of Kellogg cereal fame, patented a process for making peanut butter as a high-protein substitute for people who could not choose solid food. Some credit a writer, Julia Davis Chandler, with the first mention of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in a 1901 issue of the Boston Cooking School magazine. Peanut butter became a cheap pro- That is way too much jam. I mean, come on now. Or jelly, as the Americans call it. It's <laughs> spilling out. Teen staple during the Great Depression. And during World War II, mass-produced Welch's grape jelly was included with soldiers' rations, popularizing the peanut butter and jelly sandwich among American GIs who brought their love of the sandwich home with them after the war. Who can pass up a PB&J sandwich? It is delicious. I'm not hungry either. You're not hungry either? <laughs> Neither the bagel nor lox originates in New York, but the two together with cream cheese, capers and onions is a distinctly New York creation. Mm. No one knows exactly when it became a thing, but by the 1950s, some Jewish immigrants would use bagels and lox as an insult meaning too Americanized or assimilated. Oh. The bagel wars have been fought. Some prefer Montreal bagels, while some people think that it is literally impossible to get a good bagel outside of New York City. Oh, some people on. think that you can find a New can. York style bagel pretty much anywhere. Regardless of the bagel, the real story is that the lox in question isn't even lox. The Jewish tradition of making lox, or brined fish, began in medieval Germany and was usually made with herring or carp. Today's lox are smoked salmon. Why? It was more widely available to 19th century immigrants. Bagels and Lox was born. A po' boy is a traditional type of sandwich from Louisiana, served on New Orleans oh French bread God. and filled with oysters, fried shrimp, roast beef, or crab. The po' boy's origins can be traced back to the sandwich known as the oyster loaf, and the sandwich took on the name poor boy, or the more familiar po' boy, during the 1929 transit strike. Legend has it that restaurant owners Benny and Clovis Martin wanted to serve the strikers free roast beef sandwiches, but they wanted to be able to do it with a new type of French bread that had no tapered ends and thus no waste. Okay. You don't have to get dressed up to eat a po' boy, but a po' boy can come dressed, meaning with a topping of shredded lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, and mayonnaise. Like the aforementioned Monte Cristo, the guys, I'm starving. I don't know if you can tell, but I am. Cuban sandwich really is a ham hungry. and cheese sandwich, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. In addition to ham and Swiss cheese, an authentic Cuban sandwich contains roast pork and pickles with soft on the inside mm. bread. Despite its name, the Cuban sandwich actually originated in Ybor City, Florida, at either the Columbia restaurant or one of the smaller cafeteria style eateries in the neighborhood. 
The hearty sandwich, back then consisting of pickles, mustard, ham, turkey, salami, and Swiss cheese, Ooh. served as lunch for the immigrant Cuban cigar workers, who called the mixed meat sandwiches mixto. Looks the English speakers amazing. in Ybor City called these sandwiches Cubans. Check out one of our newest videos oh right here. Plus, even more hungry. mashed video. Man, I am hungry. That po' boy at the end, goodness gracious. And the Cuban, to be honest, every single one. The lobster roll, the Monte Cristo, the BLT, the tuna melt. As you guys know, I'm a major foodie. Believe it or not, like if you knew me, like in, you know, in real life, I love my food. I just, I can't, you know, People that like don't get enjoyment out of like a good meal, I just don't get it. I mean, for me, it brings me joy. Like, and the, the, some of the sandwiches here just looked unreal, unreal. I'm curious to like what a po' boy tastes like. I've never had shrimp combined with bread. I think it would taste good to be honest, because it looks good. And to be honest, if it looks good, it usually tastes good. I need to go get me a sandwich. Thanks for watching guys. And I'll see you in the next one.